Good morning and welcome back. Uh, we were, I was giving you a historical overview of how we got to where we got. Um, if you remember, AI is about getting computers to do things that people do well and that are hard for computers to do. Uh, it's a moving target. Uh, the first way of doing that was to try to understand how people do it and program a computer explicitly to do that. That was started in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Did not work as well as was hoped. That's an understatement. It was a big disappointment. Um, partly because of that disappointment, AI fell out of favor. And we went into a period known as the AI winter, where AI was not a cool word. It was considered you know, science fiction and not real. Um, and then some people started shifting direction and saying, OK, instead of trying to understand how people do it, uh, let's just try to make the computer learn it on its own. And that sounds very fancy, but really what it means is learn it from examples. So we'll just give the computer a lot of examples and um, an algorithm for converting these examples into a generalization, which is what machine learning is. And that kind of maybe surprisingly worked a lot better. Um, I was a graduate student here at Carnegie Mellon in, uh, starting in 86, and I joined the speech recognition team in 1990. Um, and um, at the time, they were just reeling from uh, not doing so well in the 70s and 80s um, with this knowledge-based approach. Um, and there was a new method around called hidden Markov models um, that knew nothing about speech. I mean. The group had a lot of people who knew a lot about acoustics and phonetics and lots of other things, but this new method did not take advantage of that at all. Um, and it did much better, and it was a very humbling experience. And it happened again and again in many other areas. It happened first in speech and then in language translation um, and in vision. Uh, we'll talk about how neural networks did much better than, um, than uh, algorithms that try to take into account exactly how people do vision. Um, it was a very humbling experience to see how simple, relatively simple math algorithm plus lots of data achieves much better performance than um, experts trying to explain to you how, how you're supposed to do it. Um, it was good in some sense, it was making progress, but it was also very humbling and some, somewhat disorienting. Um, the story didn't stop there. Uh, within the next um, 10 to two, one to two decades, every time we had more data, our systems would get better and better. It got to the point that it was much cheaper to just go out and get more data than to try to spend the time understanding the mo uh, domain, understanding the model, and, and improving your algorithm. And that's, that's really ups upsetting. <laughs> um, one of the... Um, early leaders of speech recognition, uh, especially of the, of the mathematical approach or the machine learning approach to speech recognition, famously said he had a group, including linguists, that was at IBM. Uh, his name was Fred Jelinek. He passed away some five, ten years ago. Um, and he famously said once, um, every time I fire a linguist and hire a computer scientist, my error rate goes down in half. Not, not very nice for linguists. Um, at least for the purpose of speech recognition, there are other, other reasons to do linguistics. Anyway, so there's a smashing success story. Um, huge progress in the 90s and 2000s in many, many areas. And then came the web. And when the web came, uh, the amount of data we had grew again, not by an order of factor of 10 or 100, but by a factor of a million. And then we have sort of web scale amounts of data. In the, in the billions and trillions. And then the question is, um, how do you transition to algorithms that, that use that amount of data? Uh, we don't always have that amount of data. Uh, we have lots of found data, but we don't always have labeled data in, in these amounts. So this gave rise to parts of machine learning called unsupervised learning, when you learn from data that's not labeled. But I'm just getting a little bit ahead of myself. We're getting to about where we are now. Um, let's go back to machine learning as a um, learning to do something from examples. So 
I'm going to give you a recipe for sort of a framework of a machine learning problem, but it always starts from what it is that you're trying to do. You have to define what is the task that you're trying to solve. So I'll give it fancy letters. Machine learning is learn a task from, I would say, from experience. And by experience, I mean usually examples. We will see cases where experience is a little tricky. It's not exactly examples of what you're supposed to do. So that's why I use the term experience rather than examples. But most of the time, it'll be examples. So the first thing we need to do is to define the task. T for task. Um, the task could be to play chess. The task could be to act as a loan officer in a bank when you get loans and you have to make decisions. The task could be to spot funny things on the web. Uh, it has to be anything. I, I think you know that. Uh, that's why you're here. The task could be things that are helpful in everyday life of professionals, medical diagnosis, predictions, things in the future, inference of things in the past. But you have to define them very well, what they are. I'll replace learn with get better at. Whoa, sorry. I'll just keep it here. What I mean by this is get better. at the task with experience. The next thing you need to define quantitatively is what it means to get better. You can get better along one dimension, but not along another dimension. So you need to define very well what the task is, and the next step is what does it mean to get better? And that usually means defining a metric, a performance metric. So we have a task T. We have a performance measure. P, which you have a choice in. And we'll talk about different, different uh, choices there. And the third thing we need to define very well is what exactly is the nature of your experience. So we'll call that E. It's experience E. And now we have a more or less fully defined machine learning problem. Get better at the task T with experience P E using a measure of success or a measure of performance P. Let's look at some examples. In medical diagnosis, suppose you want to replace a doctor or aid a doctor. Um, the task is to diagnose a patient. Namely, take everything you know about the patient, their medical history, their tests today, their complaints, the result of the physical examination, and convert it into a one or possibly more um, diagnoses, specific codes or specific names of diseases or conditions. Okay. So it's effectively medical diagnosis is an example of learning a function learning a function from patient information into a particular disease or condition maybe more than one so it's effectively brought down to learning a mapping from some very complex space into one of a set of categories. What do we call that? That's classification. Okay. So this is categories. 
into a set of categories. So if you enumerate all possible diseases, disease one, disease two, disease one million, and the mapping chooses one of them, that's an example of the mathematical concept of classification. Classification is nothing but a mapping into a discrete, typically finite set. So medical diagnosis is an example of classification. Let's look at another example. Um, suppose you want to predict tomorrow's temperature. The input for the prediction is everything you can gather that you think is relevant. Today's temperature, yesterday's temperature, the temperature in the last 100 years, today's winds, today's, you know, lottery winning, if you think it's relevant, anything you think is relevant. We'll talk about input definition and input representation later. What matters to us now is the output. The output of what you're trying to learn is a number, right? A single number, whether it's in Celsius or Fahrenheit or something else. Predict tomorrow's temperature. I'll just call it input. The output is in the set R. It's actually R plus if you're doing Kelvin, but um, it's a number, a continuous number. What do we call learning a mapping into a number? Regression. Third example. Back to the medical domain. You look at a patient that has cancer and you're trying to estimate the probability of survival for, say, five years. What is the probability that this particular patient will still be alive five years from now? Patient survival. The function you're trying to learn is from everything you know about the patient, just like in the diagnosis case, into what? What's the range of the function? Zero to one. It's a number. It's, it's a probability number. This is generally called logistic regression. Logistic actually refers to the method of use, doing it rather than to the fact that we're mapping it into probabilities. But loosely speaking, when you say logistic regression, we mean learning a probability. Now, this in some sense is very similar to regular regression. You're learning a number. Why am I? In some sense, logistic regression is very much like regular regression, but there's a big difference between them. When we're going to learn regular regression, we're going to do it from examples of weather conditions and what the temperature ended up being the next day. So we get actually labeled, we're going to do it from labeled examples, where the, in the labeled example of regular regression, you have day one, and the temperature of day two. And then you have day two or day five and the temperature of day six. 
and so forth. We're going to have a lot of examples. We're going to learn from them. <coughs> so what we're learning from is exactly what we're trying to produce. We have examples of what we're trying to produce. But when you have patients who have cancer, suppose you could wait five years and see whether they survived or not. Suppose you have a patient with some conditions and they did survive five years. What is your labeled training example? Does that mean that they have a 100% chance that the patient with this situation has a 100% chance of surviving? No, it doesn't mean that. It's just one example. What if the patient didn't survive? Now your label is zero, or died, or didn't survive. Does that mean that a patient in this situation has zero chance of survival? No. So your training examples are outcomes but outcomes is not what you're trying to learn. What you're trying to learn is probabilities. So there's the disconnect between what you're trying to produce and what the even label examples are. So this is a subtle but important difference between regular regression and logistic regression. All right, here's another example. Um, how many of you use Waze? Google Maps, Waze, driving, okay. Trying to learn a route. So given um, where you are and given your destination, come up with a plan to get there. Uh, if you've used any of these apps, uh, you'll notice sometimes they give you more than one plan and that they replan. Right? So there's something about a plan as an output that is not really, it's not a number, it's not a category, it's a different kind of object. It's an algorithm for getting somewhere, maybe with algorithm for accomplishing something, uh, maybe with some variations on what to do in different situations. I'll just call it generally a plan. Um, from mapping from input into a plan, I will not define plan exactly. This is called, not surprisingly, planning. So we have a variety of uh, types of learning. Classification is learning a function into a discrete set. Regression is learning a function into a number. Logistic regression is learning a function into a probability. Planning is learning a function into a plan to pr produce a plan. I'll give you one more. These are the things that occur most often. Sometimes we want to learn how likely things are. We have a set of uh, inputs. In fact, we don't have any output in this case. We only have input. And we want to know which input is more likely to happen next and by how much. So assign a probability to the input itself. This may sound a little abstract and a little like, why would you want to do that? But it turns out it's a very useful component in many other things. So I would describe it here simply as it's a mapping from input into the probability of that input. Um, and this goes by the name of density estimation. density because if the input comes from a continuous space, then what you're learning here is the probability density function. If the input comes from a discrete space, what you're learning there is just a probability mass function. And then the word density estimation is not appropriate, but we use it anyway. Classification, regression, logistic regression, planning, density estimation, there may be other, but I think these five together capture 98 or more percent of what machine learning does. Abstracted together, machine learning is about learning a function. All of these together.
far less sexy than saying, oh, I learned to recognize dogs, or I know what, I learned the meaning of a joke or something. It's really much more mathematical, much more prosaic. It's, it's about learning a function. Um, the important thing about a function is its output, not its input. So when we say a function is binary, we mean the output is binary. The output is 0 or 1. When we say a function is discrete, we mean the output is discrete. When we say it's logistic, we mean the output is between 0 and 1. We are not saying anything about the input. In fact, in all these examples, the input could be very complicated, typically is. High dimensional, very complicated, some, some components of it could be discrete, some components of it could be continuous. The focus is on the output of the function. When you come to formulate a machine learning problem, um, remember you have a choice. It's like when you fly United and they say, we know you have a choice, we appreciate it, you chose us. Remember you have a choice in formulation um, and that choice actually makes a big difference. So let's go back to the example of the medical, uh, no, let's go back to loan applications. Imagine that you're trying to, you're a loan officer in a bank uh, your job is to review loan applications and make decisions, and you are lazy. This is how all good computer science starts, by the way, from being lazy uh, and wanting to automate your process. So you want to train a computer program to do your job. Your input is loan applications. So any input is a particular application filled out with all the relevant demographic and financial and other information about the person who is looking for a loan. What kind of function would you learn? Well, your job is to make a decision about each loan, whether should I grant the loan or not, right? So one function you can learn into the decision, grant or decline. What kind of machine learning is this? This is classification. In fact, it's the simplest kind of classification. It's called binary classification because the output is binary. There are only two choices. If you did classification with one category, you're not learning anything, right? So two is the smallest meaningful one. Is this the only way you can formulate your problem? No. How else can you formulate the problem? Logistic regression, why? What, what would you be learning then? What? It's the probability with which it can, uh, the person will pay back the loan. Ah, the probability of payback or probability of default. When you evaluate an application, what you have in mind, you don't really care who the person is. What you only care about is whether they will pay it back or not, right? Of course, it's possible they will pay part of it back and then stop, but let's simplify things. Either they paid back or they didn't. So you can also learn from the same input probability of default or equivalently probability of payback. So this is our classification. This is logistic regression. Any other possibilities? Yeah? you can do regression on the amount of money they'll pay back. Um, so you can learn, um, you're assuming that every person will pay back up to a certain amount and will not pay back from that amount on. Okay, if you want to. I mean, 
a, a more realistic assumption is that they, their probability of paying back is going to go down as the amount goes up, right? Rather than that they're definitely going to pay back up to this amount and they're definitely not going to pay back from that amount on. Okay? Have you, any one of you ever gotten a credit report? Okay. We'll get to it in a minute. Hold that thought. Uh, credit report. What do you remember about it? Right, that's your credit history, but a credit report also has a number. Okay, credit reports, in the US at least, and I assume it's an international system, have, um, have your credit worthiness represented as a number. It's a, num a three-digit number usually. Uh, the largest number is 800 something, 900 something? 850, thank you. Um, the smallest number is not zero. Uh, I think it starts from like 600 or 500 or 400, I don't know. Why they do that, I don't know, but the point is, it's a scale, it's a numerical scale, the higher the better, okay? And that's a number that um, credit card companies care about and that uh, loan officers care about. They use that very significantly to decide, to help decide whether to grant a loan or not. Credit worthiness uh, tries to capture in one number um, how worthy you are, how, like, how responsible you are, how capable you are of paying back the loan. It's actually a complicated thing because your capability and your intent are all different things, but they try to capture it in one number. So that would be a mapping from a loan application, same input, into a credit score. And that would be regression. regression. Somebody suggested uh, density estimation. You still want to suggest that? No? Okay. Yes. If, if you're designing a product for them of how they will play back, how they will pay back, the output would be a plan. You're quite right, and it may be, very well be a plan that would need to be, um, would need to be revised, replanned, uh, depending on how, how they're doing. That's a great idea. So if, you, if I wanted to show you all of them, I can tell you a story for all of them, but these three are very reasonable approaches. Right, I'm, I'm not forcing anything here. These are all reasonable. Now, which ones would you prefer? What would you teach your program if you were the loan officer and you wanted to replace you? Logistic regression? Well, that seems to be a consensus. I'm sorry? Classification. classification. Okay, there's a vote for classification. Oh, okay, there's a vote for all three. All right, let's take a quick vote. Uh, who's for? Decision making, binary classification, raise your hand high. Okay, that's a good number. Okay, who's for logistic regression? Okay, that seems to be higher. And who is for regular regression? All right, we have decent support for all three. So I want arguments for and against. Okay. Uh, so you're saying with uh, with this option, you're not really making a decision. You're just a decision support tool. You're um, leaving it to the loan officer to decide. Here, you're making a decision. Okay, that's true. And it, you're saying it could be good or bad. All right? Please. Wonderful question. The question is, uh, or the statement is, that with this one, um, the way you're going to use it is maybe by putting a threshold, saying anybody who has a probability of default greater than 10%, I'm going to decline, or greater than 50% or whatever, some threshold above which I'm going to decline, otherwise I will accept. So practically, this one is like this one, 
once you put the threshold in. So why would you bother doing that? Is that what you're saying? Okay, anybody wants to answer that? Why would you bother doing that? Even if I told you in advance, okay, go ahead, uh, please. If, if you have a few good loans, but uh -huh. one great loan, and you have a limit that because it's like the reserve threshold, you can only accept a few loans, and your classification problem would say grant all of them, then you're in trouble. But if you learn that one of them has a very low probability of default, and the others just have a low probability of default, you can make a better decision. I like that. Let me paraphrase it. Um, here, you're not really learning anything relative uh, about the strength of the applications relative to one another, except are they in the camp of accept or the camp of decline. Here you can rank them. You can say which loans are better than others so that if you have a variable amount of money or if you feel more risk-taking on some days or other days, it's in your hands how to go down that, that list, that line. So it gives you more power. Okay, uh, somebody who wants to argue for this one. Yes? You're saying it's a more fundamental property, it's something more important to know, and then you can put it to use. Um, I, I, it sounds vague, but I actually agree with that very much. I do think that it's important to, to learn the fundamental things rather than the surface things. Uh, one way to look at it is to say you can convert a credit score into probability of default, more or less, but there are other things that affect this, for example, the amount of the loan. If you get many applications and different applications have different amounts, then two people with the same credit score may have a different probability of default if one of them, the amount we're talking about, is larger, or the term of, re of returning it is larger, or whatever. On the other hand, if you learn this, you still didn't learn directly something useful. You still need to learn how to map this to this, and then how to map this to this. So I'll tell you something about, a practical thing about machine learning. Usually, if you have a goal that is well-defined as make the best, the most accurate decisions you can here, okay? If your only job in the bank is to make the accept or don't accept decisions, and you're judged by how many of them you make correct, then practically you're better off learning this directly. You will do better by learning this directly if you have appropriate trading examples, then by learning these and going there. But for any other goal, you're better off being here. So you have to take a step back and ask yourself, what is really your goal in the bank? Is your goal to make the right accept or not accept decisions? Or is your goal to maximize the return on investment for the bank? If it's to maximize the return on investment for the bank, then you want to take into account how many loans you can make, so you want to rank them and make only the ones you can, and maybe only um, the decision of whether to grant or not would depend on how much money you have, on um, uh, the size of the loans, on when they're going to be paid back. And if your goal is even more than that, if your goal is to understand the behavior of customers and maybe design new products for them, then I very much agree with your, your statement that this is a fundamental thing. This measures something about the customer that's separate from the loan itself, so that when the same customer comes back with a request for a different loan, you can use the same number. So the choices you make here make a big difference. They can make a, dif a difference to your performance, and they can make a difference to what you can do with this. So this is not something to jump quickly over. This is actually a really important decision to make. Which of these are to use? Let's do one more example. This time it's taken from uh, Tom Mitchell's book, and it's about playing chess. Your task is to play chess.
The goal is pretty well defined. You want to win as much as possible. You want to win competitions. Um, what I want to focus on is the nature of the experience that you will learn from. If you're going to train a computer program to play chess from examples, or from experience, what kind of examples will you give them and where would you get them? Yeah? Basic rules of chess. I'm assuming that you put it in. Fair enough. That's the first step. But I wanted I wanted to make good moves. I wanted to win, right? Yes. Okay. All right. That's a good um, good possibility. Uh, nature of experience. What was suggested now is games played by experts. Any other possibilities? So you can feed the games played by experts into your algorithm as examples of strong play. Please? You don't need to feed that in. Once you have the rules of the game, you can generate yourself all possible moves. Right? What we're trying to learn is the difference between good moves and bad moves. Yep? Uh, there's also the consideration of like, a greedy approach versus, uh, like, it's about, like, if, uh, like if, you, if you're able to beat a queen of the opponent, is that a win or getting the game finally at the final stage within the game is a win? So mm. there may be a position where have to sacrifice your own queen for, for that, and, but still you may be able to win the game. Let me paraphrase. What you're saying is that you may want to learn not just to win the game by checkmate, but learn heuristics of what are good things to do along the way to maximize your chance of winning at the end. Yeah, like a local maximum. Okay. Local maximum. That may very well be true, but what I want to focus on here is the nature of experience that you are uh, going to feed as examples into your program. Yeah? Uh, Suggestion here is games played by beginners. Okay, I accept that. Yes? Many games played by two machines against each other. Ah. Games played by machines. Anything else? Yep. Do you need an entire game played by a psychopath? Maybe just moves played by a psychopath, but okay. Games played by psychopaths. Um, think outside games, beyond full games. What else can you learn from? When you learn to play chess, who did you learn from or what did you learn from? if you learn to play chess. Uh, you probably learn from your iPhone. Uh, think, think, think. Please? Okay, so that would be positions plus good moves and bad moves in those positions. Where are we, where are we going to get these from? Books. Books. Okay. Let me suggest also experts. So we can hire a chess player to annotate these games. So these are from books and from experts. Any other sources of experience, please? Nature of players. 
uh, like things about the players you say uh, you're suggesting well you su you're suggesting that knowing something about the player would help me choose Uh, you are you you're thinking yeah you think this might affect predicting the outcome of the game yeah. uh, but yeah. the nature of the player nature of the player is aggressive or defensive or yeah. oh, so you're talking to style of players you're talking about learning style of players i see i see what you're getting at let me skip that on the board because i want things that are direct experiences that i could use any one of these things i could just take a large number of them run an algorithm on and get a decent plain computer program what you guys are suggesting is a little a little more hazy at this point yep previous moves in the same game yeah. okay how does that help us make so better moves So learn from uh, previous moves in the same game. I would say that falls maybe under this one and by machines. All right, suppose you have access to an expert, a chess expert. What would be a good use of their time for you to extract information from them that you could put into? Yeah? Play against them. So it's actually not listed here. Here we have experts and we have beginners and we have machines, but we can also have um, machine against expert. Let me suggest one more thing. I don't know how many of you know chess, but uh, you look at a position and you can evaluate it. If it's good for white or good for black or about equal. Right? In chess books, many times you arrive at a certain situation and a certain variant and the author of the book, who is a chess expert, says, well, there's a slight advantage for white here, or there's a big advantage for black here, or this position is lost for white, or this position is about equal, and so forth. So you can extract that kind of information from chess players, uh, chess experts, and that is basically examples of positions and their value. Their value for white or the value for black, you can record the value as a number, 100 being, plus 100 being white is absolutely winning. Negative 100 means black is absolutely winning. Zero means it's a very equal position. You, you, you don't have a preference which side to play. They're both equally likely to win. And any number in between reflects something in between. Okay, so that would be learning from positions, positions and score. Um, some pros and cons. Ah, the la how are the last two different? Uh, that's a very good question. They are very different. Um, here you're given a position and you're told what's the best move in that position, but you're not told at all whether that position is a good position to be in. You're likely to win or you're likely to lose. You're just told what's the best move you can make here. In the second one, you're told the value of the position, but you're not, set, you're not told how. Suppose it says it's a very good value, you're very likely to win. Uh, it doesn't tell you how to win. But there's a relationship between them, right? Because in chess, you can do a look ahead in your head. You can try different moves. So suppose you had a function, a black box, that you feed it a chess position, and out comes a number between negative 100 and positive 100. That is the value of that position for you from your side. Then you could use that function to suggest good moves. How? I'm sorry. Right. You enumerate all possible moves at your disposal. For each one of them, you simulate that move on the board. You look at the position that resulted from your move, you feed it to your black box, out comes a number. Let's formalize this.
You're learning a scoring function, call it F score, which is a mapping from board position into the range of numbers from negative 100 to positive 100. You're going to learn that by regression. This is regression. Could even be a continuous number. How are you going to use that function that you learned in playing a game? The answer is, given the board position, you're going to enumerate all possible moves, all possible moves M. You're going to modify the position to be the position after move M. Then you're going to take that as your input, feed it into your score function. It'll give you back a score for each possible move. And then you're going to ask yourself which move resulted in the best position. This will be an argmax over all moves. And the argmax would be the move that you take. So the winning move I call M star. And it would be generated by repeatedly calling this function as many times as there are legal moves, typically 5 to 10 to 20. The alternative is to learn directly a move function. Function from board position into a move. This is classification, right? You're learning a discrete uh, function into a discrete domain. Which one is better? First one is better, why? Go ahead. So you can generalize this very simple algorithm to multiple steps ahead and then call the evaluation function at the end of those steps. So that supposedly would give you better performance. And that is very true. Modern machine, uh, uh, chess playing machines uh, do a lot of look ahead. Other reasons? Yeah? I didn't uh, fully understand. Do you want to try so it again? Generating scores uh -huh. for both positions. And suppose that when you're playing, you're not just looking at the uh, subsequent questions, but many levels deeper. So if you are generating scores for moves, and you have uh, one, two, three, and you know that one is lower, you don't have to go deeper for the one? Got it now. OK. The idea is that if you generate scores, you can rank the moves, and then you can go deeper in your look and you look ahead, and the moves that look promising. Yeah, and I believe that uh, programs that play chess do exactly that. Um, any arguments in the opposite direction? Too many moves. Uh, is, is it possible that we will be in a position with a too many moves uh, here? You mean or here? Yeah, I think it's true for both. So maybe what you're getting at is that there's more computation going on here because you have to consider multiple moves. And if you do look ahead, then the number multiplies by a lot. Uh, so it will require more computation. That's, that's a fair argument. I will accept that. Um, let's go back to the nature of experience. Is one of them easier to get training examples for than the other? So when I ask you to come up with a list of possible training experiences, almost all of them 
were in the form of games. That means position, move, position, move, position, move. If we want to train this kind of function, we need to get an expert to annotate positions for us. We need an expert to sit down with the board and we give them position after position and they have to give it a number. A, it's tiring. B, people are not very good at assigning numbers. They are far better at making decisions. This is, a, again, a general rule. It's not a mathematical rule. It's a psychological rule. But people are much better at making decisions between the options than at evaluating probabilities or evaluating numbers. So um, you're likely, it's likely to be the case that multiple experts in the same position will, are more, much more likely to agree on what's the best move or the best three moves than they are to agree on the exact numerical or even rough numerical value of each position. But the most important argument is that there are plenty of games out there by experts, by psychopaths, by beginners, uh, and definitely by machines, because you can generate those as much as, you know, as much as you want. So there's much more plentiful training examples for learning a move than for learning a score. So that's one, one other consideration to keep in mind. All right, so let me end this fluffy part of the course um, with... a general algorithm, if you wish, or a list of uh, steps to take when you approach a machine learning problem. Um, I find it necessary because many times I was approached by students wanting to do something and they were jumping to step seven without realizing that they've actually implicitly made lots of choices in steps one through six. So I want you to be aware of these, of these choices. So, how to approach a machine learning problem? First of all, start with your goal. You have to um, not quantify, but um, define and scope out exactly what it is you're trying to achieve. If you're a loan officer in a bank, you have to ask yourself, is my goal just to replace me in making the yes or no decision? Or is my goal to maximize the uh, return on investment for the bank? Or is my goal to get a promotion? Or is my goal to understand how customers behave and as a result of that maybe offer them new products? These are different goals and they may lead to different formulations. So you define the task T. Consider the nature of available or potential experience. There are different kinds of experiences you can learn from. We saw that some of them are easier to accumulate than others. It's easier to accumulate examples of positions followed by good moves um, than uh, to accumulate examples of positions with their numerical evaluation. Um, ask yourself how much data can you get uh, of that type and uh, how much will it cost you? And by cost, I don't mean necessarily dollars. It could be cost in time. It could be cost in some other currency. Um, then you choose the output that you're going to learn that will help you accomplish your task. And that's when you're making a decision, is it going to be regression, is it going to be logistic regression, is it going to be classification, is it going to be planning or something else. And next, you choose a performance measure. How do you know you're getting better? How do you know you're good enough? It's not just how do you know, it's you're up to you to decide what is considered getting better, what is considered good enough. You can choose different measures and they would lead to success or failure or different performance. You could be very good along one measure and not so good along a different measure. So you need to define very well what you mean. If it's about making decisions about loans, it could be the percentage of um, loans that you made the right decision relative to an expert loan officer who's standing there and judging you. You know, what fraction of the time you said accept, reject correctly. 
Or it could be how much money you made for the bank. That'll take five years to learn. Or it could be how many customers you brought. It could be lots of things, right? Once you define these four things, you have a well-defined machine learning problem. Until then, it's not well-defined in the sense that different people can understand it differently and build different things, and you cannot blame them or compare them to one another. They are doing different things. Once you nail down these four, now you nail down the competition very well. You define the performance measure. That was an important component. Now I can tell you that this is better than that. Is it? You still did not define it well mathematically, but you defined it well enough um, for people. The next step is to choose a representation for your input. Now, that's a tricky one because you want your input to have everything that's relevant for solving the problem. Um, how do you know what's relevant for solving the problem? You're a loan officer. What's relevant for making a decision about, about loans, whether credit rating or probability of default or just a yes-no decision? What's relevant? Person's income? Prior loans? Did they repay them or not? Anything else about them? There could be a million things that were relevant. We don't know what's relevant. We think we know. We have some preconceived notion, but we could be wrong. At this stage, if we miss things that have a real impact on their likelihood of repaying the loan, we're going to be doomed. Our performance is going to be capped. So we try to not miss anything that we think is relevant. And one way to do that is to throw everything in, right? Is that a good thing? No, why not? Computation. Computation is a problem, I agree, but that's not my main concern. You can make things worse by including lots of non-relevant features. That is true. It kind of, many of you know that this is, leads to overfitting. We'll talk about overfitting. But um, more conceptually, if you throw in lots of things that are not relevant, you may end up finding spurious relationships, relationships that just happen to be true in your training data and are not really true, are not likely to be true in future data. That problem, the likelihood of this happening grows as you include more and more features. So what you really want to include is only features or aspects of the input that are relevant and nothing else, right, ideally. But we don't know what's relevant. So we don't have a mathematical solution to this problem. This is more of an art than a science. And it does take you having some belief about the domain. It takes you understanding something about the domain. You know, if I took a Martian and gave them a thousand uh, possible um, facts about humans who are looking for loan applications and asked them which of these are relevant for making a loan application, they will shrug their shoulders if they had shoulders. Um, the point is, you, when you design a loan application learning program, you are using something about what you know about what loans are. And that people, you know, you know something about financial world and about uh, debt and about cost. And you know a lot. Is it relevant if they are young or old? Is it relevant whether they own a home or not? You make these decisions whether to throw things in or not into the model. These are important decisions, and they're not mathematical or computational decisions. These are decisions based on the domain and your understanding. And you could very well get it wrong if you miss something. One way you know you may have missed something is if you have two inputs that are identical, but their output is different. So let's talk about medical diagnosis. You have two patients. Their medical records are identical. They have the same disease, the same condition, same measurements, same lab results. One of them dies, the other one survives. How does that happen? One explanation is that you miss something important. There is a, a hidden variable that you did not take into account. 
Are there any other possibilities? Yeah? Could be? Anomaly? Okay. It could be an anomaly. I could, uh, looking for a slightly different definition of that. Yeah? Yes, so the, the answer here is it could be that given these inputs, there is a, say, 60% chance of survival, and one of them fell on the side of the 60, and the other one fell on the side of the 40%. Uh, I'll rephrase that as saying that it could be that the process is inherently random, inherently stochastic. Namely, that the function we're trying to learn is inherently a stochastic function, meaning that the same inputs uh, will not always produce the same outputs will have some probability of producing one output and another probability of producing another output. Um, these are the two main explanations. One is that you're missing some inputs, and the other one is that the function is inherently random. It's hard to tell them apart. Uh, in fact, even if you go back to something as solid and concrete as physics, uh, I don't know how many of you know quantum theory, but when quantum theory first came on a stage about 100 years ago, there was a raging debate. Um, until quantum theory, um, Newton's mechanics and other uh, Maxwell's you know, electromagnetism and so forth were deterministic um, theories. The fundamental rules of motion, according to Newton, are deterministic. The same starting conditions would always lead to the same trajectory. There's no question about it. In quantum theory, that's not the case. Starting condition leads to a particular distribution over possible continuations. And there's no way of telling which one it's going to be, except we know which ones are more likely, which outcomes are more likely. Uh, some people had a very hard time with that. Einstein was the greatest physicist of the time. He did not invent quantum theory, but he followed it, and he lived around the same time, and he participated in that debate. Um, and he did not accept that the laws of nature could be inherently random. His famous saying is, God does not play dice. He said it in German, but that, that's a, a translation. Um, now, that's not a mathematical statement. That's his personal belief. Today, most people accept, most physicists accept that, um, if you, using Einstein's words, God does play dice. Uh, the fact that Einstein felt so strongly that the laws have to be deterministic was maybe a product of his, his time and his, his beliefs. Um, there's no reason to think that the world has to operate by deterministic rules. It can operate by random rules. Random rules doesn't mean that you don't understand the rules. The rules can be very well specified, but they are um, stochastic. The alternative theory that he uh, supported was that there is some hidden element in the situation that determined whether the atom went this way or that way, or whether phenomena happened this way or that way, so that there was this additional information that was missing. So the debate is kind of still alive today, although not as raging as it was in the 1930s. Um, but the point is that if it's difficult to tell apart in something as concrete and mathematical as physics, it is very, very difficult to tell apart in if something as fuzzy as loan applications. So we can't, we can't always be sure that we got all the information in. Is it, a, is it a matter that we didn't get it all in, or is it a matter we got it all in and the process is, is stochastic? Once we decide what are the in, things that should go into the input, we also have to decide how to represent them, and that makes a big difference as well. Uh, you will sometimes see examples where some of our inputs or features or covariates, they all mean the same thing. Um, we do some transformations of them. We take the log of it. Why? Because we believe that the log representation is more likely to lead to a, um, to a better solution for reasons we'll, we'll talk about later. Or some other transformation. When you start transforming your input, you're actually starting to do the learning. There's no clear boundary between what you call input transformation or input representation and the first steps of learning. After you finish this fifth step of representing the input, now you have a mathematically well-defined problem. 
The mathematically well-defined problem is find a function from the space of x to the space of O. Find a function from, this, from the domain x to the range O that minimizes the performance or optimizes the performance measure. Let's say something about the performance measure. I call it the error function or a loss function. Loss is somewhat more general than, than error. Uh, you can also call it a figure of merit, uh, in which case higher is better. Uh, error or loss, lower is better. Um, sometimes it won't be error or loss. But error or loss implies that there's an absolute bottom at zero. But sometimes your performance measure does not have a clear bottom. It would be the higher the better or the lower the better. Now you have a well-defined mathematical problem. And your next step is to admit that it's impossible to solve it. Um, what do I mean by that? We have a well-defined input space. We will call it x, right? And we have a well-defined output space, that's O. For classification, this is a discrete set. For regression, this is a continuous range of numbers. For logistic regression, it's the range from 0 to 1 and so forth. And we're trying to learn a function from one to the other. How many functions are there from x to O that we can choose from? That's a tricky question. My microphone died. There's battery on it. Can you hear me? Are you still okay, Hannah? Okay. Um, how many functions are there from some input, space of inputs? So these are all the possible inputs. X1, X2, and so forth. There are many, many possible inputs, and there are quite a few possible outputs. How many functions are there? There could be infinitely many if either one of these two is an infinite set. So the, the correct mathematical answer to the question of how many there are is a lot. <laughs> um, in fact, an awful lot. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, about them. In fact, let's do it right now. Suppose they're both finite. N, in, N possible inputs and M possible outputs. How many functions are there from M possible inputs to N po from N possible inputs to M possible outputs? All right, I want you to um, form groups of before you form groups. Think for yourself what your answer is. M possible, N possible inputs, possible inputs, M possible outputs. How many functions? How many distinct functions? A function is distinct if it differs. Two functions are different if they differ in their output on at least one input. Right? It's considered the same function only if it gives, if they both give every input the same output as the other one. How many functions? All right. Take a minute to convince yourself and write it down. I'm not going to see it. Nobody's going to see it, but I want you to commit to it yourself. Write down your answer. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Do you uh, have a... I do. 
No, it's, it's not this. Is it this one? No, no, this is this is hers. Well, no, don't change that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's put it. Um, uh, this is. I am confused. I guess this is the one that died. But I thought, I thought I put this one there. I think this this is one is yours. There, plus it's the same battery is dead. Yeah, this one's ah. definitely yours. Okay. You can hear me okay? Okay, so that's the one that's dead. All right. You all wrote your answers, I hope. Now, I want you to form teams of three that are sitting next to each other. If it doesn't divide exactly and you can make four, make four. Two is okay, but three is ideal. All right, like here, you're four, just be four. I want you to compare your answers um, and reach a conclusion. Try to convince each other if they're not the same. All right, let's stop here, even if you're not done. Um, can I have a show of hands? How many of you encountered different answers in your group? Didn't start with a consensus. Can you raise your hand, please? Raise your hand. Different. Okay, so not everybody, but some. Can I have a show of hands of how many of you changed your mind as a result of the discussion? Very few. So those who had a difference of opinion in the group did not convince each other. Okay. All right. In, uh, it's really a great exercise to continue. We'll do it some other time with some other problem. Now we'll just move on. Let me give you the answer. Um, the general answer for the number of functions, it's a very simple formula, is the size of the range raised to the power of the size of the domain. In our case here, the range is m, the, range, the size of the range, that's the number of possible outputs. So the domain is the set of the inputs, range is the set of outputs, of possible outputs. Uh, so this becomes m to the power of n. For any real world problem, uh, this number is astronomical. In fact, it's doubly astronomical. We'll talk about it next, next week. It's really, really, really big. Our next step is to restrict this set to a much, much smaller set of candidate solutions. Why do we do that? Will be a subject of a lot of discussion. Do we have to do that? Will be a subject of some of your homework. But for now, let's just accept that the next step is to take this huge space and make it much smaller. The way we're gonna take this space and make it smaller is by deciding in advance that we're only gonna consider some kind of functions, not all of them, not all m to the n functions, but a sub subset of them. Um, incidentally, when these m and n are infinite, this expression still has a meaning. Uh, it would be in infinity, but there are different types of infinity. 
Uh, it could be discrete, countable infinite. It could be n uh, continuous, non-countable infinite. Um, hi. Um, so it, it's not uh, a finite number, but it's, go it's still going to be a measure of of, um, of size. But even when it's infinite, some infinities, uh, even though they're mathematically equivalent, may be practically very, very different. So for example, if you're trying to learn a simple function from some number x to some other number y, it's just like y equals f of x. And if you have some training examples in the form of pairs of inputs, x and y, so here's one, and here, here's one, and here's another, and here's another, and here's another. So each one of these are x, y pairs. Um, you may want to learn from these five Five examples? Yeah, five examples. What is the set of all functions that you could learn? It's all functions from x to y, right? They don't even have to be continuous. There are infinitely many of them. You can choose to restrict yourself to learning only linear functions. Linear functions means straight lines. Now you reduce it to a problem of slope and offset. How many linear functions are there? How many linear functions are there? Infinity also. You have offset and slope, and these are both continuous numbers. So the number of linear functions is infinite. The number of functions overall is also infinite, but one of them feels a much larger infinite than the other, right? Um, but it, it is, in some sense, a larger infinite, but in another sense, it's not. Um, the point is that we may choose to restrict ourselves to learning only linear functions. In that case, we will say that our hypothesis space, which we call H, is the space of all linear functions. Or we can choose to restrict ourselves to um, uh, polynomials of second degree, parabolas, which is a superset of the linear functions. Or we can restrict ourselves to polynomials of up to degree five. Or we can restrict ourselves to all polynomials without restricting the degree. That's still a strong restriction because most functions are not polynomials. Or we can restrict ourselves to continuous functions. That's still a very strong restriction. Most functions are not continuous. Most random functions are not continuous. Or we can restrict ourselves to functions that are constant. I mean, we can make any assumption we want. Some of them are going to be stronger in the sense they're going to restrict our space much more, and others are going to restrict their space much less. But we're going to make some restrictions, and they're usually going to be very strong. Very strong. We're going to shrink the space of, possibility, of possible things to consider significantly. We call that H, possible solution set, or hypothesis space H. It could be continuous. It could be discrete. And once we made that choice, the problem is not just mathematically well-defined. It's also computationally well-defined. Because now we're saying, find one member of H that you think is the best one for optimizing the measure of performance P. The next step is to design the learning algorithm that takes your experience or your training examples and uses it to narrow down or to zoom in in the space H on one member on one function. In our example of linear functions, take your training examples and use them to zoom in on one linear function, namely a particular slope and offset. Now, most machine learning students want to start here. They're very eager to learn the latest and greatest algorithm. The goal of this hour was to tell you, don't start there. That's the end. There are so many steps before that are really important, and if you make the wrong choices there, by the time you got there, the game is already lost. If you threw out some useful training information, if you didn't define the problem properly, if you chose the wrong performance measure, then you're not going to succeed here. Okay? So keep that in mind. We're going to become much more technical from here on, but I want, and we are going to spend a lot of our time here, but we're also going to spend some time over there. There is an assignment that should be out today. It has two parts. 
uh, it's to give you practice in both um, canvas assignments and auto lab assignments. It's just like a practice thing. The first part, part A, is a canvas assignment. It's to familiarize you with the course policies. You can submit it as many times as you want until you get it all right. The second part is um, Autolab programming. It's just to give you some practice and to give you a sense of the programming and then how to use Autolab. Uh, they're not out yet because we have some technical glitches. Um, I'd like them done by Wednesday, regardless of when they come out. Hopefully they'll come out today. Have a wonderful Labor Day and we'll see you next Wednesday.